Hello everyone, we are doing module 3 on cache coherence. This is lecture number 8 where we are going to discuss the messy protocol. Of course, it is a neat and tidy protocol not as messy as the word says. So, we have uh, seen two protocols already. The third one is a four state MESI protocol. The types of messages here uh, similar to the MSI protocol or I would rather tell you in advance that this is very similar to the MSI protocol except that we have added a new state E. So, you can always do a difference with MSI to understand the MESI protocol. All right. So, uh, similar to all the protocols we have a uh, read write request from the processor coming and then uh, if this request hits or misses into the cache appropriate actions. So, in case of hits no problem serve the request. In case of a miss on a processor read uh, this cache needs to fetch the data from the system that is uh, across other processors. Uh, if there is another cache having the modified data from that cache or from the main memory. Okay, so, on a processor read we need to send a request on the bus to fetch the up to date data item. On a processor write we are going to send a bus write uh, signal. Now, this bus write signal uh, translates into a bus read x signal because we are dealing with invalidation based protocol right because we want permission to write similar to the MSI protocol. And then we have two other transactions related to write which are called the uh, flush and the write back. Okay. So, bus read x is uh, sent to get permission to write. Then the flush is uh, mainly going to write the data onto the bus for some new sharer to read it from uh, this particular cache. So, bus write back is when uh, the block gets evicted from this cache and it has to be written back to the main memory. So, we are discussing a four state MESI protocol. There are four states M for modified, E for exclusive, S for shared and I for invalid. It is an invalidation based protocol as the state I also is indicating. Then this is for write back caches. So, all these conditions are almost similar to the MSI protocol that we have discussed. Okay. Now, uh, why is this protocol important to study? Because this is a prevalent protocol and variants of this exactly not the same protocol, but some small variants of this have been used in the Intel Pentium processors, the PowerPC and the MIPS 4400 series etcetera. Right? So, this protocol has been implemented in real processors and uh, initially this was published by researchers from UIUC and hence it is often called the Illinois protocol instead of the Messy protocol. So, if somebody tells you what is an Illinois protocol then it is the MESI protocol. Okay, so, what is the motivation for MESI? We understand the MSI protocol where M is the state uh, modified state where the cache block has modified the data. S is for share that is there are multiple readers of the block. Now, imagine a scenario where I have mainly sequential applications running on a multiprocessor setup. Now, when a sequential application runs it hardly interacts with others or even if it is a parallel application with less shared data most of the accesses will be done by a single processor. Now, if this is the case then the same processor is going to read the data item, write to the data item and uh, repeat the process. All right. So, if I am executing such an application with a MSI protocol, I am first going to send a read uh, to the bus and I may get the data item into the shared mode. Later, I have to acquire the modified permission for writing it. But if we imagine a sequential program or a serial access program, then this extra request to acquire permission for writing is actually not required because essentially there are no sharers of this particular block. Okay? This same application running on a single processor is going to do read and write, there are no sharers. So, these two transactions are uh, causing essential performance bottleneck. Okay, so, that is the motivation for uh, the messy protocol. Now, what is the idea behind this that if we know somehow that this particular cache is the only cache in the system asking for the block then can we give some extra rights to this cache in the form of exclusivity. That is I will say that this cache is the exclusive uh, owner of this block meaning that nobody else is sharing this data block. Now, what does this tell me that suppose this block wants to write to uh, 
this data again, right? So it wants to write again, then it need not take permission from others because there are no other sharers. So this is the extra E state which gets added, okay? Right. So similar to the MSI protocol, we have the three states, but in case of sequential applications, there is no sharing of data. We unnecessarily do two transactions. The first transaction takes us to the S state because we start reading the blog and immediately we want to write to the blog. So we again send the uh, bus redex to obtain writing permission. Okay? So we send first bus read, then we send the bus redex, whereas we know that there are no other sharers. So how do I uh, solve this? Concern, right? So for this, I'm going to introduce a new state called E, which is called exclusive, but um, it need not give permission of writing, right? So it's called exclusive clean. It doesn't mean that the block is modified. It is a clean block, and therefore the memory also has the correct copy of data. So E means I am the only uh, cache holding this block. There are no other sharers and we can write to this without informing others. So that's the meaning of the E state. And if you change the data block, that is your written to the data block, then the state becomes M for modified. So remember E is not a modified state. E only tells that this is the only cache holding the block. And if you want to write, you must move to the M state. So the uh, four states here, invalid, block is not present in the cache, shared means there are other caches holding this particular data block, implying main memory is also up to date. Then we have exclusive, only this cache has the copy, memory is of course up to date, but this cache is not modified, that's important. The data is not modified in the E state, whereas if you want to modify, we have to go to the M state making the data dirty and eventually if there is a new sharer wanting this data block then this is the only cache having the data and it should provide this data to others. In this M state memory is out of date and before this block becomes M all other copies have to be invalidated that is if we go from E to M then we don't have to inform others right. So here I will say do not inform because we know that this cache is the only copy. But if we are in any other state, for example, if we are in the S state, then to go to the M state, we need to inform others that is invalidate the other copies. So we look at a general description of the protocol and then uh, we will go to draw the finite state machine. Okay. So processor reads a block and if a valid copy is... Uh, present in the block, we get a cache it, okay. If there is a cache miss, then we have to go onto the bus to find out whether we can load the block in the state S for shared or E for having exclusive uh, permission for this block, okay. So S or E decision has to be done. That is uh, what happens in the read. Now if the processor writes to the data block, if the state is E that is exclusive, the processor can simply write without informing others. But before writing, we have to change the E to the M. And uh, if the state is S, then we have to invalidate others. All right. So in the case of write, if the state is E, then directly move to M and start writing. If the state is S, then invalidate others, move to M and then start writing. Now, uh, what are the requirements uh, required for the system due to the E state? Now, we have introduced a new state E and does this put anything else on the hardware design? If you can imagine that I am using the E state to tell that this is the only cache holding the data block. Now, how do we know that there are no other sharers? So, we should somehow know, how do I know that there are other sharers or not in the system? So for this, we need some help from the system. Now what is that? Every cache controller should be able to tell if they have the data block. So if they have the data block, they should inform that yes, I have the copy. And if nobody responds, then this cache will know that there are no other sharers. Now imagine how would you want to do this? You can pause the video and think for yourself as to how will we implement this in a real system. Okay. So when a request for reading goes on to the interconnect, every snooper 
is going to read the address. It will compare the address with its cache and identify whether the block is present or not. So once it knows this information, if it does not have the block, ignore the request. If it has the block, it has to inform that it is one of the sharers present in the system. So this information should go. Now how will this information go? Okay. So every cache which has the block will send a true signal onto a single wire. And we are going to implement something called a wired odd signal called the shared signal. So every cache is going to send signal saying that yes I have the block, this one will say yes I have the block and so on. Right? So all the caches, some will say no I do not have the block. Right? So these wires will have a signal 1, this will have a 0 and then essentially we are going to put an OR gate here to generate this shared signal. Okay. So, this red line is that wired OR signal coming out of every cache one wire comes and finally it gets OR here to give you one final answer. Okay. So, we need hardware support for doing this. As we saw we need a combination of all these uh, wires coming out of the snooper to tell whether they have the block or do not have the block. The shared signal S is called uh, asserted if the OR gate gives output equal to 1. So, this is equal to 1 if there are sharers. If any one of these inputs is 1, then your S will be equal to 1. If no cache has the block, then S will be equal to 0. So, S equal to 0, what does this mean? That S bar is equal to 1, that is the complement of S bar is 1. And in the slides, I have represented S bar by this English word S hyphen B A R. Okay. Right. So, I assert the signal S when there is a sharer and we assert the signal S bar or rather S is 0 if there is no other sharer. This signal S will help me to decide whether I want to go from I to E. So, what do you understand? That if this S this is the shared signal, okay. This is not the state S. So, if S is equal to 1, then from I you will go to S because there are other sharers, else you will go from I to E because there are no other sharers. So, this is the decision logic, okay. Now, let us understand this protocol with an example, okay. So, we have uh, three processors, the colors represent different data blocks. As you can see, the blue block is present in P1, it is not present in P2 and it is not present in P3. So, if it is present in P1, that is uh, initially suppose P1 sends a read to this block. What would have happened? Suppose it was here to begin with or if I say 0th step, it was invalid, 0th step, this is invalid and this is invalid. Now, the first step P1 reads, when P1 reads, it has to first find out if P2 and P3 have the block. If they have the block, it will go to S, otherwise it will go to E and we know that it is invalid in P2 and P3 and hence after reading, it will go to E, the exclusive state. So, end of step 1, P1 will go to E and uh, the others will remain here, so they are still invalid. Another action, P2 sends a read for that data block. P2 has the block in I, it sends a bus read signal. So, when it sends a bus read, P3 responds saying I do not have the block, but P1 responds saying that yes, it has the block. So, in this case, the wired or signal S will become 1. Because it becomes 1, P2 will move to S, right. So, here P2 moves to S and this also forces P1 to move to S because P1 cannot stay in state E, both of them move to state S, okay. Third uh, event which happens is P3 performs a write that is it sends a bus read X signal, uh, this is sent to invalidate other copies. Okay, so, other copies that is P2 and P1, they have to invalidate. So, in step 3, this invalidates, this invalidates and what happens to P3? P3 moves to 
state M and not E. Okay, remember on a right we have to move to M and we cannot go to E. Okay, so with this I uh, hope you have understood how the protocol functions. Now we we'll look at the transactions and then draw the FSM. So on the bus what all transactions are happening? A bus read goes, a bus read X goes. Now when a bus read goes, uh, this bus read will be responded by the shared wired OR signal. Now this wired OR signal uh, S will be true if there is a sharer, it will be false if there is a no sharer. So we are going to use two types of uh, bus read uh, notations. One is bus read with a S saying that there are other sharers and a bus read with a S bar saying that there are no sharers. So two uh, notations for bus read. Then we have bus read X with the common understanding till now and for data write back. So we have two types of flush signals. The first flush signal is saying that I have the dirty block and I am going to give it onto the system if there is a new reader or if I evict the data block. And there is another flush prime signal. Now what is this flush prime doing? There is a small prime put here if you can see. Even this means uh, do the data transfer, but this actually says that probably their memory or other caches also are equally capable of giving the data. In case of flush, this is the only cache, right? It has the dirty copy and it has to give the data, but in flush prime, it is uh, not obligatory that this cache should give the data, but if it happens to give the data, then we use the flush prime signal. Okay. This feature is used in cache to cache transfers which we will understand towards the end of this lecture. But if the cache to cache transfer feature is enabled, a particular cache which is responsible for giving the data to the new requester is going to use the flush prime signal and other caches which may have the data block will ignore. They will simply uh, do a state change without giving the data. So now we will start drawing the MESI FSM. As usual, I am going to use two colors, blue for things happening from the processor side and red for things happening on the bus side. Put I state here. So I'd also request that you uh, keep drawing the FSM as we keep discussing so that uh, it doesn't become a big picture at the end, right? So you, you slowly build the idea as I do it in the lecture, you also do it with me in your notepads. Okay, so we start with the state I and I'm going to use the blue color because we are going to discuss the processor side transactions while in state I. So we are in state I and a processor read happens. If a processor read happens, we can either go to S or to E depending on the shared wired or signal. Okay. So I can go either here or I can go here. We first need to write the input. So it is processor read and then we send out a bus read. So once we send out a bus read, if the S signal is asserted, that is there is another sharer, we have to go to S. And if there is no other sharer, we go to E. So on a processor read, if I send a bus read resulting into S bar, that is S complement being true, we'll go to E. That's on read. What happens on a processor write when we are in the state I? From state I, we have to directly go to M because we are not permitted to go to E for writing. So from here, we will go to M, processor write, send a bus read X. Okay. We will send a bus read X. In this case, we ignore the shared wired or signal because the bus read X by default will trigger the invalidation for sharers if they are present. So we will move to state M. Okay. Now we will uh, deal with state E. We have come to E because we are the only cache having this block. Within this state, if there are any reads, we can continue to read without sending any signal outside. 
if there is a write while we are in state E, we can immediately start writing without informing others, but we need to change state to M. Do not inform anybody, but move to state M. That happens in state E. Let us finish state M because in state M, we are the owner and we can read write any number of times. So, we have a self loop on processor read, processor write without sending any transaction on the bus. Okay. Now, state S. In state S, if there is a processor read, we can continue to read without sending any transaction onto the bus. Here, if there is a write, we again go to state M by sending a bus read X. So, I will take it from here and on this arc, I will say processor write, send a bus read X and move to state M. Okay. So, we finished all the processor side signals on all the states. Now, we have to handle the bus side signals. So, we will uh, use the red color and see what all things happen on the bus and how does our FSM respond to them. If we are in state I, if a bus read or a bus read X goes onto the bus, we have to do nothing. So, I am not going to draw any arcs from state I. Okay. Now, if we are in state E, in state E, if we see a bus read, what does that mean? That there is another reader into the system trying to read the block. So, if this reader reads the block, then I am not the only copy. Hence, I cannot be in state E and I should move to state S because the other is a reading request. So, if I see a bus read happening, then we move from E to S. Okay. Here, we can say that because I have the only copy, we can volunteer to give the data to the new sharer. So, I can also flush the data. Okay, so, these uh, whether to flush or not to flush the data, who gives the data, these add variations to the messy protocol. I am assuming that if I have the only copy, uh, memory also has the correct copy, but let me voluntarily give the data. So, here I am going to give the data. Okay. What happens if there is a bus read X when we are in E state? Okay, some writer has come into the system and I have to relinquish the block becoming I. So, if you see a bus read X coming, then no action or you could voluntarily give the data block as we did in the case of uh, bus read. So, we could provide the data and turn the next state to I. So, that is E to I. Okay. In state S, let us handle both the transactions. In state S, if a bus read happens, what are we going to do? So, here read is there. So, I will put a self loop because we can retain the data copy. Should we provide the data here? In case of E, we provide it because we had the only owner, right? Uh, memory had the correct data, but we also had the correct data. But when we are in S, there are other caches having this data block. So, is it my responsibility to give or will somebody else give? So, so there will be some decision logic which takes care of this, but in case you were supposed to give, then here I will put the flush prime. Okay? So, in this case, I will put the flush prime signal saying that if I was supposed to give or I was instructed to give this data block, then I will give the data and remain in the state S. From state S, if you see a bus read X, what will happen? Again, the same logic from S, we will go to I on a bus read X because invalidation based protocol. And if we were supposed to give the data block a flush prime, if we were not supposed to give the data block, then simply put a hyphen here. Right? So, this becomes uh, no action if we were not supposed to provide the data. Okay. Next, uh, we will go to state M. In state M, if we see a bus read, uh, there is another sharer into the system. So, we have to go from M to S. So, from M, I will go to S on bus read, 
do we provide the data? Yes, we must provide the data. So, it is flush and not flush prime. We have to give the data because the latest copy is with this particular cache. On a bus read x, we will go to i by providing the data. So, give the data and go to state i that is invalidation based protocol forces us to evict this data block. So, on this slide I have put a neater diagram. So, that was the MESI FSM. Now, some variations uh, that we were discussing about uh, flush versus flush prime and uh, uh, some other decisions which affect the different types of protocols people derive out of, F out of MESI. Okay, now, if I ask you a question, is it possible that I have a block in state S and uh, when there are actually no other sharers into the system? Okay? This block is S, but there are no sharers. Whereas, we started with the premise that uh, if there are no sharers, the block will be in state E. Okay? So, under this question, the answer to this question is yes, because uh, initially there were no sharers. So, this particular block became E. Later, new sharers joined the system. So, this became S, there were other uh, sharers. So, there were several in the state S. Slowly, they evicted their data blocks. And this eviction of data block was not informed to me. So, if there were four sharers and one by one they deleted their data block, I would not know that there is no other sharer apart from me. Right? So, in this case, uh, even if I have the state S, there is possibility that there are no other sharers into the system. So, that is uh, one aspect of the messy protocol which can happen, but it does not affect the correctness. Okay. There is a small variation uh, or rather a popular protocol called the MOESI, MOESI protocol. It is derived from the messy protocol and now what is the small change here? Okay. So, here uh, we assume that whenever a cache block has modified the data item, so it is in state M when other sharer comes into the system, the data block is flushed out. Okay? So, when it is flushed out in the messy protocol, the memory is going to update itself so that all the caches will go in the state S. Okay? You want to recollect then look at the FSM. When we are in state M, when we are in state M, from state M if a bus read X happens, we flush the data and we go to state I. Okay. If a bus read happens, we flush the data and go to state S. So, what does this mean that whenever a flush happens onto the system, the memory gets updated. So, memory is also updated onto this flush and then all the other caches will be in the state S. So, S means shared with memory having the up to date uh, copy of the data. Okay. Now, if I am saying that uh, let the memory not update itself on every bus read x or a bus read happening. So, if I do this, what does it mean? Uh, okay, let me take an example. The block was in state M in the particular cache and a read came. So, bus read came. So, during this bus read, I had two choices that go to S and update the memory or somehow remember that I am supposed to provide the up to date copy in future because here the memory is not changed. So, memory not updated. If we do not update the memory, then some cache has to take the responsibility of providing the correct data. So, this is the new state O for ownership. So, it is an owned state exclusive, but memory may not be having the valid data. Now, uh, we also give a feature here that the ownership can be transferred. Okay? So, when I am in state M and there is a new sharer joining the system, uh, so that sharer becomes S. So, either this system, this one can become O, taking the responsibility of providing the data or this can move to an O. Okay? So, either of them can happen. The particular cache becomes owner of the block. Owner means other copies also exist. M means writable copy, O means readable copy, but this block or this cache has the 
most up to date copy and memory does not have the up to date copy okay so that is a small variation called the moe si protocol which has come out from the messi protocol so messi satisfies coherence so here uh, the two properties of write propagation and write serialization uh, we all know these properties by now and here the proof is exactly similar to the messi to the msi protocol and hence we won't go into details of this so you can refer to the proof of msi protocol for the correctness of mesi protocol okay so are there any lower level design choices that i have okay so when both uh, memory and cache have a valid copy and that is i don't have a m state so everybody is in state s and memory also has up to date copy and a new reader comes into the system so who should provide the data this uh, refers to the flush prime transaction i was discussing okay so in case we decide as a designer that if all the caches have a up to date copy and memory also has so let one of these caches give the data block instead of the memory giving so this is called the cache to cache sharing now here uh, there are some design challenges also because how would the memory know that it should give the data or not because memory has to somehow keep track that is there a cache who would give the data if there is no other cache to give the data then the memory has to give the data so this logic has also to be implemented in the controller to decide who should provide the data okay so in case we permit that a cache supplies the data it is called cache to cache sharing however uh, there are counter arguments which say that uh, modern systems do not wish to do this why because intervening into the cache of another system that is disturbing another processor and demanding that that cache gives me the data may be more time consuming and expensive rather than bringing it from the memory so there are pros and cons to each decision but the original uh, illinois protocol used the cache to cache sharing so what's the complexity here the complexity is how does the memory know it has to supply the data right so there are these many caches into the system and then the memory is also connected here if there is a new reader so this one wants to read it sends a request on to the bus so should this cache give the data should this cache give the data or should the memory give the data okay, so if i say 1 2 and 3 so should 2 3 one of them should give right so we need to select who gives that who uh, out of 2 and 3 will give or will memory give so overall the memory controller has to keep waiting looking at the bus that is anybody giving the data because memory does not know about the sharing state of the caches so it has to wait until certain uh, cache gives the data and if it doesn't give the data for uh, some while it concludes that there are no sharers so it has to acquire the bus and transfer the data to the requester okay in case there are multiple caches that is in my example cache number two and three had the data block now among them who will give so we need a selection algorithm to do this so should two give the data or should three give the data okay so uh, in spite of these uh, challenges or complexities i would say that uh, if you have a cache coherent memory system uh, which supports distributed memory then cache to cache sharing is good why because the memory being distributed it is possible that the particular block may be present in a remote memory and not in your local memory right if you can recollect the distributed shared memory had uh, different memory modules distributed across several nodes in the system okay so why because uh, it may be cheaper to bring the data from a nearby cache rather than going to a distant memory so this has been implemented in systems which use SMP nodes. For example, the Stanford Dash processor uses this particular option. Okay. So the Messi protocol with a cache-to-cache -cache sharing is a good enough idea if the memory is very far and if the memory is close by, better take from memory and not disturb the other caches. These are lower level design choices uh, which we can explore. Okay. So with this, we finish the MESI protocol discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.